Yeah. 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 And we only get one. So in that generation. Yeah. 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 Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming out on this beautiful President's Day weekend. I'm Jane Kamensky, president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, and I'm both delighted and honored to welcome you to the launch of Frank Cagliano's landmark new book, Revolutionary Friends, Washington, Jefferson, and the American Republic, hot off the presses today. It's a launch on actually publication day. Like its author, Revolutionary Friends was nourished by its association with Monticello and nourishes Monticello in turn. It's the job of an introducer to set the stage for what follows and then to get out of the way, but not before lauding the author just enough to make him blush, especially in front of his family. And I understand there are maybe one or two Caglianos in the house this afternoon. Frank Cagliano is professor of American history and Dean International for North America at the University of Edinburgh, where he recently celebrated his 25th year on the faculty. This year, we're fortunate that Edinburgh has seconded him to Monticello, where he's serving as interim Saunders director of the Robert H. Smith International Center for Jefferson Studies, or ICJS. Frank is a prolific and distinguished historian of the early American Republic, with a particular focus on the life and work of Thomas Jefferson. A fellow of the Royal Historical Society and frequent commentator on the BBC and other outlets, he's the author of, or editor of 10 previous books, including an often reprinted and regularly plagiarized one volume history of revolutionary America, as well as authoritative works on Jefferson's foreign policy and on the rise and fall and rise again of his reputation among scholars and the public at large. I'll get to revolutionary friendship in a moment, but before I do, consider the fact that Frank is already hard at work on his next important intervention, co-authored with Peter Onuf on why Jefferson still matters. Frank's work, like Onuf's, has helped to make that so. Yet Frank pulls no punches about the complexities of the man and his times. For a beginner's introduction to Frank's work, you would do well to look at the short trenchant essay he published on our website in 2018 when the Sally Hemings exhibition opened on the mountaintop. The essay is called Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson, Monticello and the Importance of Words. For nearly as long as he's taught at Edinburgh, Frank has been deeply involved with the ICJS, where his scholarship, colleaguehood, and mentorship made and continue to make an enormous imprint around the center and across Monticello. In the scant weeks, we've worked together regularly since I arrived in Charlottesville last month. Frank has consistently lifted up the work of his ICJS colleagues in the Jefferson Papers, the Getting Word Oral History Program, the Archaeology Department, and much more which brings me to revolutionary friendship. I submit that Frank's talent for collaboration, which you can also see in the many conferences he's shaped and the multi-authored books that he's wrangled or edited, allowed him to see a subject that had hidden, unresearched, in plain sight for more than 200 years. The ways that two of our most studied founders, Washington and Jefferson, built the early American Republic around their friendship and their philosophies in tandem. It's a story of civic friendship. It covers half of Mount Rushmore. I'm still not sure how he's gonna get TR and Abraham Lincoln in the same room for the successor volume. Revolutionary friendship insists on seeing Washington and Jeffers, Jefferson's relationship facing forward rather than looking backward from the partisan crack -up of the 1790s. Like all of Frank's work, it's deeply researched and learned, but it also has a textured humanity showing on every page that it grew out of rich and sometimes heated discussions with colleagues also connected to the ICJS. You'll hear from a couple of them this afternoon too. After Frank introduces revolutionary friendship to us, he'll be joined in conversation with two other towering Jefferson experts who need no introduction but I'll offer just a whisper of one anyway. Annette Gordon-Reed is Carl M. Loeb University professor at Harvard University 
and has won every fellowship and award you can name, including a MacArthur Genius Grant. She is the author, most famously, of The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family, which recentered our understanding of an entire era while treating all of its subjects with profound respect. She has profoundly shaped Monticello over decades, and the ICJS shaped her too. She was shoulder to shoulder with fellow historians in Charlottesville before she trailed any of the honors that accompany her now. One of the most important of those fellow historians in Charlottesville is Peter S. Onuf, Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor Emeritus in the Corcoran History Department at UVA. Onuf, too, is both a reigning expert on Jefferson's world and a peerless collaborator, some of whose most important interventions have been made through mentorship, through co-editing, and co-authorship, including the recent character study of Jefferson, Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, which he published with Annette Gordon-Reed in 2016. In sum, these three are revolutionary friends, and we're so lucky to be in the room where it will happen with them this afternoon. With that, let me welcome Frank Cagliano to the stage to kick things off with thanks. Thank you all, and thank you, Jane, for that very generous introduction. I received a less generous comment from my daughter last night in anticipation of this event when she gave a great sigh and said, you know, we say it's not about you, but I guess tomorrow, that is today, really is about you. <laughs> and I guess it is. I, reflecting on one of the great scenes in American literature, in Tom Sawyer, when Tom and Huck attend their own funeral, and Tom says it was the proudest day of his life. I feel a little bit like I'm attending my own funeral today, and it's great to have so many friends and family in the room. I want to offer some thanks, first institutional and then personal. Institutionally, there are two institutions that have shaped me and shaped my career and shaped my scholarship, and Jane mentioned both of them, and I'm grateful to her for doing so. The first is the University of Edinburgh, and the second is Monticello. As for the University of Edinburgh, it has been my academic and personal home since 1997, and it's a great, great pleasure and privilege to work there. I was talking to one of our distinguished guests just a minute ago before we started, and he said, I'm a little disappointed you're not Scottish. He's not the first person to say that to me, and he won't be the last. Uh, my colleagues in the School of History, Classics, and Archaeology in Edinburgh are wonderful. I hope some of them are tuning in tonight. Uh, and they have been great friends and supports throughout my career, and they've helped me in immeasurable ways. I have another job at the university, which Jane alluded to. I'm also one of the university's international deans. And I have the great privilege and pleasure of representing the university around the United States and Canada. Uh, doing student recruitment, alumni engagement, partnering, all kinds of things. And the colleagues I work with in Edinburgh Global on that work are really, really wonderful. And I'll tell you just a brief anecdote to illustrate how this has shaped and influenced my work. A few years ago, I was driving with a colleague from Vancouver to Seattle. And we got in the rental car in Vancouver. And she said, great, you need to tell me everything I need to know about American history. And I said, well, we've only got three hours. She said, three hours is as much as I can take. <laughs> we got to the border between British Columbia and Washington State, and we were waiting in the line to cross the border. We just about got to the Civil War at that point. We got right up to the border guard. He asked me what we were doing. Well, he turned to my colleague who was driving, and he asked her, he said, what's the purpose of your visit? She said, I'm here to learn about America. It's amazing what you can get away with with a Scottish accent and a smile. He turned to me and said, well, what, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm here to teach her. This book started thanks to a question from a University of Edinburgh student in one of my classes who asked me about the relationship between Jefferson and Washington. And I gave them an answer, which was more or less the standard textbook answer, and then thought, I don't really know anything about that, or not enough. And then I did a 
literature search. We were all supposed to do that uh, and discovered there was no book that traced the relationship of Washington and Jefferson in its entirety. And that set me off on this journey. And so Edinburgh has shaped me. Edinburgh has been incredibly supportive of my research. Edinburgh allowed me to come here for the year. And I'm very, very grateful to the University of Edinburgh, particularly my colleagues in the School of History, Classics, and Archaeology, and in Edinburgh Global. So I want to publicly acknowledge them. My second institutional debt, and the other institution that has meant so much to me over the course of my career, is Monticello. It's a great, great privilege to be here today. And it's been my immense privilege to spend this year, or the academic year roughly, from July until next July, working here, running the International Center for Jefferson Studies. ICJS has meant a huge amount to me over the course of my career. I've, it's been my privilege to see it grow and to participate in some of that growth, but I've really gotten to know it in the past seven months while I've been directing it. And so I'm, I, I can't express my gratitude enough to colleagues at ICJS and in Monticello more broadly. Yesterday, I had the privilege of talking about this book with my friend Patrick Griffin, about whom more in a moment, um, with some of the guides from EVP. And I want to take this moment to acknowledge the important work that those guides do. We people, with the exception of Annette, who writes bestsellers, people like Peter and I write books that might be read by dozens. <laughs> The guides at Monticello, the guides at Monticello and at other public history sites speak to hundreds of thousands of people a year. And they're doing the hard work at the chalk face, talking to the public, trying to convey complicated information. God bless John Ragosta, who did that with 25 members of my family this morning. <laughs> but these are incredibly hard conversations to have sometimes, because if these interactions are to be meaningful, we have to discuss hard things. And the guides at Monticello and at other public history uh, venues do that every single day. And they do it with professionalism and good grace and good humor, often under difficult circumstances. And so I want to pay tribute to you. So Monticello is an incredible, has been an incredibly important institution to me. And sadly, my association with it will end this summer. And that's a story for another day. Uh, but I will always love this place and love this, the people who work there, including so many of you who are in this room. And I thank you for what you've meant to me over the years. Now to get personal. I would ask you to look to your left and look to your right and then and, and, and say, okay, there's a high likelihood you're sitting next to someone who is related to me either by blood or law. <laughs> but if you're related to me by blood or law, raise your hand. <laughs> there are a lot of people in this room. They've come from London and Edinburgh in New England, in Chicago. I didn't leave anybody out, did I? No. Uh, and I'm just really, really grateful to you for having made the effort to come here. Uh, there's a This book is dedicated to my siblings, and I'm so, so pleased and, and gratified that you're here. I want to talk briefly about my nuclear family. I'm not going to identify everybody by name because we have a limited amount of time. <laughs> I'll say with regard to the number of people who are here, when we were planning this, the colleagues from events said, how many tickets do you need? Thinking I was going to say three or four. And I said, 27. <laughs> uh, but in terms, I, I do want to acknowledge my wife, Mimi, and my children, Sophia and Edward, who are here, and Sophia's partner, Rob. And unfortunately, Edward's wife, Emmy, was unable to join us today. But you mean the world to me. Finally, this is a book about friendship. And I am really, really lucky to have good friends. And in the past few months, I've discovered just how good those friends are. My friends are exactly who I knew, knew them to be. And there's no greater gift than that knowledge. And in particular, I want to call attention to three people who are here. Annette and Peter, who Jane has already introduced, but also Patrick Griffin from the University of Notre Dame, who's sitting in the back with typical 
humility. <laughs> Patrick and I had the privilege of talking to the guides yesterday. And Patrick, Peter, and Annette have shaped this project. It's so important for me, and I'm so grateful to them for being here. They've shaped this project in so many ways. Not least, so this project began with a question from a student. And I started writing it, and we'll talk about how I did that, I imagine, in the course of our conversation. And then I got stuck. And you know, folks who've written books will know that. I hit a roadblock where I really thought, I can't do this. I don't know how to structure this book, and it's just not working. And we were at a conference organized by ICJS and my colleague and predecessor and friend, Andrew O'Shaughnessy, so I need to acknowledge him, in Santiago, Chile, when Peter or Annette or Patrick, it doesn't matter which, any one of them might have asked this question, was asking me, how's the book going? And I said, I don't know. I'm really stuck now. And the three of them took me out and said, okay, we're going to solve this problem. And we spent a lengthy afternoon in a cafe. Intellectual work is hard. <laughs> Talking about it and breaking it down. According to Patrick's recollection, there may have been Pisco Sours involved. <laughs> I couldn't possibly comment. But what happened, and they all were true to form. Peter was gesticulating wildly and conceptualizing and not entirely intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> Making sense. <laughs> Annette said in her quiet yet commanding way, just tell the story. And Patrick said, stop complaining and write every day, you'll get it done. <laughs> so it was a it was a but it was an incredibly important moment to me, and it's stayed with me since. And there have been dozens of those over the years. But in terms of this particular project, it's incredibly important. And this book is about friendship, and I'm so, so grateful to them for being here. And I'm incredibly grateful to, for all of you to come here and mark the launch of this book, which is about friendship. And I'll tell you what I did, and then we can go on with the conversation. I read Jefferson and Washington's correspondence from start to finish. I didn't read it backwards. I read it in order from start to finish in order to recover the context and the evolution of their relationship, and it was revelatory. And so I began with that premise, and that's the story I've tried to tell in this book. So as I call Peter and Annette up, the one thing I'd like to do last is acknowledge what a great job Harvard University Press did producing the book. I'm incredibly grateful to Kathleen McDermott, who is my editor at Harvard, as well as to my agent, Chris Rogers, who helped to place it at Harvard. So without further ado, you've heard enough from me, at least in this context, let me invite Peter and Annette to come up so we can talk about the book, and we'll hopefully have some time for questions and answers at the end with all of you. Thank you for coming. I hesitate to say who's first, but... <laughs> Well, I'll start, Frank, and I <laughs> a few things I'd like to clear the air with. Uh, Frank, it's a, a real thrill to be here, and what a wonderful event for one of the great people on this planet. I have uh, infinite admiration for you as a human being, and you're a pretty damn good historian, too. <laughs> uh, Frank, uh, we promise to give you, not a hard time, but a, to give you a little edge. Sure. Uh, these are hard times for people like Thomas Jefferson, not so much George Washington, but the <laughs> founders. Um, the founders' collective reputation is swirling down the cosmic toilet. That was a, a grotesque image. I don't really know. <laughs> uh, you decided to do something that nobody had done. And you put these two iconic figures, and maybe iconic is a good adjective, and maybe what you've done is to help us get past that, but you put them into conversation. So I'd like you, as you look forward to the 250th of the Declaration, when I think many of us, uh, Jane included, would like to see some kind of civic revival of let's get back in touch with these guys because there's something that we need to know about ourselves as a people 
and maybe we need to do the hard work of taking stock. By doing what you've done, you've described the process of writing as one uh, marked by revelation or epiphany that you've discovered things. How does this possibly represent in your mind the beginning of a better understanding of the founding? Okay, that's an easy one, Pete. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> These are all yes. <laughs> So just say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then ask a question. <laughs> well, I think the founders and the founding matter. That's why we're interested in what's going to happen in 2026. The founding still matters. We live in a moment, and this is not to preclude the value of other approaches to the past. Of course not. But we live in a moment where we ourselves are obsessed with our political leaders and who they are and their conflicts and so on, yet we often disdain the study of similar individuals, I'm not saying comparable individuals, I want to be clear about that, in the past. But we, we care about politics and political leaders in the present, rightly so. I think we need to in the past, and I think they do have things to tell us. And I think the semi-quincentennial is really, really, it's a moment for taking stock because we, as a people, are in a moment of questioning what it means for us to be a people. And the founders, when we look at the founders, we return to first principles. Jefferson, in particular, articulated those principles in the mission statement of the nation. And, of course, those principles would be forgotten if Washington hadn't led the effort that led to independence and so on. So I think they matter more than ever. Yet, this is the subtext of your question, I think, they're unpopular mm -hmm. or they're problematic. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that's in the book too. These are, these are individuals that are difficult for us to reckon with mm -hmm. if we only, if we question them from the kind of, from our own contemporary concerns, from the perspective of our <laughs> contemporary concerns. And we should do that, but I think there's still value there. We, you know, people are complicated, but they still have lessons to teach us. Mm -hmm. Well, they're complicated people. And first, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here talking oh, to you about thank this you. as well. Um, it's interesting that nobody has done this, right? It seems like an obvious subject matter for people to, to talk about. Um, what struck me, and one question I've had is, you know, Studying the two people, how do you think, well, how is Jefferson, how did Jefferson and Washington mesh? <laughs> did, you know, was there real affection, do you think? Was it just about their politics or just that they happened to be thrown into a moment where they had to do a project together? I mean, it's, Washington isn't, doesn't strike me as the warmest person. Uh, you know, complexion. <laughs> and Jefferson, you know, they don't seem to go together except that they're Virginian. They're both tall. Oh, they're important. slave owners. <laughs> they're these things that they have in common. But how did they? How did they work together? I mean, how did they fit together? And did it strike you that that, that their connection was, you know, tenuous from the beginning, or was it natural from the beginning? Because I don't see them. As a, as a pair. Yes, and I, I think that's one reason why there is very little on this relationship. There are, I should say, there's a very good essay by Peter Henriquez on their re relationship, yeah. which I need to acknowledge. And there is a book about their falling out. Yeah. So it's not the only book ever written about their relationship. Mm -hmm. But I, I would argue this one is unique because it traces the whole course of their yeah. relationship. Mm -hmm. And in answer to your question, Annette, they mesh because each has what the other doesn't. So Washington's, uh, Washington's a military guy. Mm -hmm. Washington, well, Washington is the, you know, Virginian above all Virginians and the mm -hmm. American above all Americans in that period. But Washington has that presence. He's got, he's got physical, he's, he's got physical presence. He has charisma. He has a military bearing and a military record. Jefferson doesn't have any of that. But what Jefferson has is that incredible breadth of knowledge. Mm -hmm. He's multilingual. Mm -hmm. 
Washington is monolingual. He has experience traveling in Europe. Washington never went to Europe. Um, they complement each other. Mm -hmm. Jefferson, I, I, I mentioned this in the book. Um, you know, Washington's early training is in the wilderness as a soldier, mm -hmm. right? And he gains the lessons there that he will need for the rest of his life. Jefferson's early training is at Williamsburg with the governor and his professors having dinner <laughs> and learning enlightenment sense, uh, sociability yeah. and tapping into that world which will serve him so well. They complement each other because they're kind of opposites. Crucially as well, I think, is the 11-year age gap. So what, Jefferson is not young enough to be one of Washington's surrogate sons, mm -hmm. and he's not part of his military family. Mm -hmm. But he recognizes Washington as both his uh, is older than he is, and he, he shows deference to him, and also is more, when they meet, much more famous than he is. Mm -hmm. um, and, but but they, they can look each other in the eye, and I think they, it, what begins as a fairly transactional relationship of two people who happen to be Virginia, Virginians who work together during the war becomes quite a close friendship for a time mm -hmm. until it's... Till it's not. Till it's not. It's it's not. Till it's not. But for a period of about, they knew each other for 30 years. I think they were pretty close friends, and I mean that genuinely, for about 10 of those years in the middle. And they worked productively together for a very, very long time until they did. Mm -hmm. So one other follow up, sort of follow up to this. So how did they become, how did these two people who did have all these things in common, and you say that they're things that are different, but they're some sort of basic things, Virginian, slave owners, this, how did they have to co come to have such different visions of the new nation, of what the new nation should be about? People disagree about politics, right? <laughs> Yeah, but <laughs> even I mean, people from the same background. Yeah, they did from or the same, similar background. Uh -huh. But what is it about Washington that made him a nationalist? Right. Okay. Good. Um, I think, and when I got stuck in Santiago and was really working with you guys and Patrick, um, it was over this question of Virginia and how prominent Virginia should be in the book, and because at one point that was the kind of center of the argument, and I moved slightly away from that, but not entirely. I think Washington outgrows Virginia. Washington becomes a national leader mm -hmm. and a nationalist. At one point, he jokes about moving to Pennsylvania. He's not serious about that. He's, he's a Virginia. <laughs> um, and Jefferson never does. As cosmopolitan as Jefferson is, Jefferson wants America to be Virginia writ large. Washington, I think, become, as a result of his leadership during the War of Independence, has a much more national okay. view. They've all got national views, yeah. but I think... Jefferson thinks Virginia is the, should be the model for what America should become. Well, now, Peter will tell you that he's yes, got to Yes, I was pushing against you, and I didn't win that one. Uh, Frank, I want you to focus on not Virginia, but provincial Virginia in the British Empire, thinking of the, the big theme being, what does empire mean? That's their experience. That's what they've lived. Uh, and that's what they're looking forward to is, in a way, an idealized version of the British Empire that failed in the imperial crisis. If you substitute empire for nation, what does that do for you? How does that affect your argument? Right. I think, and you and I have discussed this a lot, um, they are both Anglo-Virginians, right? Mm -hmm. And they see at least well into middle age for both of them. They see the future of this place, Virginia, as part of the British Empire. Yes, it's not a contradiction in terms. No. It's not local versus national. It's that provincial within an imperial, post-imperial relationship. That's right, that's right. And, and I think that's incredibly important to them. In that sense, and I suspect this won't be the tagline for 2026, Jane, the Declaration of Independence is a failure because it's an admission that this <laughs> hashtag, okay, this is so. <laughs> it's a, it's an admission that this this Anglo-Virginian conception that both of them have when they're younger of a, of a British Empire, a greater British Empire in North America and beyond, isn't working. So the Declaration of Independence, while it brings into being or, or announces a new people, mm -hmm. 
uh, it's an admission of failure at some level for, for, for each of them. Um, but that then begs the question, okay, wither Virginia in this? And so Washington, as you know, and you love this quote, I, I don't want to take it from you, refers to the wretched fragments of empire that are, that are emerging from the revolution. Making Virginia equally wretched with the others. <laughs> Washington wants to create a new empire, if you will, out of those wretched fragments of empire. Jefferson conceives of, okay, Virginia can become the template for this new thing. Mm -hmm. But what's really important here, and what's really, what really struck me when I was reading the correspondence in order, you start at the beginning and you go to the end. It's so important to do that. You know, watch the story unfold is, first of all, there's contingency here. It's inchoate, and they don't know how it's going to go. So there's a lot of experimentation. We know how it ended. They don't know that. <laughs> uh, Frank, would you uh, suggest that both of them were disappointed in their last years? I mean, uh, Jefferson could crank it up and write that wonderful letter to Roger Waitman, uh, never give up, basically. Uh, that, that might build on this provocative uh, statement, which is now going to be the official Monticello line about the Declaration <laughs> being a failure. <problem. laughs> uh, they, they were, and I don't know what this is like because I'm a nearly dead guy myself, and I have a cheery at, uh, attitude towards the world. Uh, they, they, this was an experiment, and in some ways it, uh, it was disappointing. I wouldn't go that far. I think I just want to push you to yeah, I understand. I understand. I mean, I think Washington, well, he's disappointed because he dies so young and his retirement is relatively <laughs> short. Yes. Um, and I think he was looking forward to a longer retirement. Uh, but I think Washington, you know, if you read the farewell address, yeah, there are concerns expressed there, but he's confident. He's reflecting on his life's work, and I think he's pretty happy with it. I think he, I think he's, he, he's come through and adjusted to this new this new way of doing things. Jefferson is more pessimistic late in life, in part because he lives that much longer, mm -hmm. and he lives to see the strains that are starting to endanger this Republican experiment, especially slavery, especially in the aftermath of the Missouri crisis. He reckons, you know, it's a fire bell in the night. He's worried that the Union might founder on the rock of slavery. Mm -hmm. So. He's kind of worried about the moral dimension of slavery, but not really as much as the, the damage slavery might do to the Union, rather than the damage slavery is doing to the enslaved. But he's much, more, I think he's much more pessimistic. Well, he also, they're in very different circumstances. Yes. Yeah. I mean, personal circumstances, personal economic circumstances. Washington is in pretty good shape, right? I mean, financially, he's rich. He's rich. <laughs> when he dies, I mean, the economy's well, everything, and Jefferson is watching everything fall apart, essentially. I mean, so not just the nation falling apart, but his own sort of personal domain and circumstances. That's right. I mean, he died in debt. Mm -hmm. We know this in, in huge debt. Um, he was worried about what that meant for his family. Mm -hmm. uh, he was worried what that would mean to this place. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, after the panic of 1819, mm -hmm. he's got, you're, you're right, he's got personal reasons to be depressed, you know, not just because of the Missouri crisis. And, and I think there are different, pers there are differing personal circumstances, especially financial. Do you think you, do you think you got to know Washington? I mean, I know you spent a lot of time uh, on Jefferson, so that would be, there are probably things were not as revelatory to you, but what about Washington? Do you think you got to know him? How do you know any of these people? Well, that, I mean, but, insofar I mean, as you can. But you're right. I mean, it's a bit, I, I thought of this, it's a bit like being left-handed or right-handed, right? Mm -hmm. And I've done a lot, of, I spent a lot, I've spent a lot of time on Jefferson. Mm -hmm. I'm left-handed. So Jefferson's my left hand in this argument. <laughs> and my right hand is, you know, I can't write as well with my right hand as I can with my left hand. And, and I had to kind of develop my right-handedness mm -hmm. uh, in doing this project. So I read a lot about Washington. I read a lot of Washington's writings. And Jane was asking me about this before we started. And I don't know that I got to know him, but I really came to appreciate him. I, got to, I learned a lot about Washington. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned is Washington's really smart. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you kind of poll people in the street, they would say, yeah, I once gave a talk here a few years ago, and uh, I called it about in the early stages of this, and I called them the valedictorian and the prom king. 
And I still think there's merit to that, that analogy. But Washington as the prom king or the football captain is a good analogy, I think. But he's very, very smart. He's a good thinker. He's a clear writer. Mm -hmm. Often clearer than Jefferson. <laughs> um, and he's a man of real convictions. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I knew all of that to some extent, but I, I really the, I came to appreciate it with much more depth and detail, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Frank, uh, you have spent more time with Jefferson, much of your best years of your life, you might say. <laughs> I said I introduced the funeral analogy. <laughs> so, uh, Frank, my question is this: It's parallel to Annette's. Uh, times have changed, and everybody thinks about Jefferson differently, whether you want to or not. But you've also made an additional effort to get into him, and you really focused on him with the benefit of com of a comparison of comparator. And this is the question that really matters at Monticello. How do you really feel about Thomas Jefferson? <laughs> and, and how has that changed from the way you felt when you were, had a lot more hair? <laughs> <laughs> and that you've had a chance to study him. <laughs> really do, man. You're getting a flavor of that conversation in some <laughs> I'm rubbing my head now. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> These uh, questions not from your sibling. <laughs> uh, well, Pete, I think anybody who studies Jefferson in any kind of detail has to be deeply conflicted. I love the term. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, Jefferson's going through a bad time right now, reputationally. As somebody who spent a lot of time studying not just Jefferson, but his reputation, he's a little bit of a trough, I think. I think he's going to come back. Well, he always comes back. He never goes away completely. And I think he should. Look, he enslaved over 600 people. Well, and... That's a serious question and will remain so, and it's central to the work we do here. Monticello is not just Jefferson's home, it's probably the best documented plantation in the world. And that work is incredibly important. So, but Jefferson was not just an enslaver. Jefferson's, we have statues of Jefferson for now, despite his slave his relationship with slavery, not because of it. And it's because of his other achievements. And those achievements are incredibly important to this country. And it, they have shaped this country. And frankly, given the importance of this country globally in terms of its power, shape aspects of the globe. And so Jefferson is a person of world historical significance. But he was a person and people are complicated. The older I get, the mellower I get on this, where I just think, you know what? People are complicated. People's relationships are complicated. Nobody's all good or all bad. And that applies to Thomas Jefferson, too. Yeah. But if you're asking me, do I like him? Well, that's, that's a, a silly, kind of silly question. question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who would ask such a question? <laughs> Annette, please. Take no. <laughs> <laughs> me? Well, what about, I would say the thing about Washington. I mean, what, you know, one of the things that interests me about him is that, and not knowing that much about him, is that he did asked Jefferson to be Secretary of State and Alexander Hamilton. He seemed like someone who, even though he didn't have the education that Jefferson had or the reputation, but he had, he seemed to like other people who knew stuff. Do you know what I mean? That he wanted yeah. them to come together. So that's enough confidence. Is Was it confidence on his part that he knew that he had something that he, you know, could do or his, he was confident in his role and so he didn't mind? You know, having Jefferson there as the valedictorian, he was perfect. As the prom queen, that the king, that was enough <laughs> for him to be? Yeah, I think he does have that confidence. First of all, he's a very good eye for talent. He's got a really good eye for talent. Um, and he identifies talent, and he wants good people to work for him. Uh, he knows he's first among equals. Mm -hmm. And nobody, I see Lindsay back there, nobody in his cabinet is going outsh to yeah. outshine him. Mm -hmm. Right, Lindsay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they're just not, mm -hmm. even Jefferson. Mm -hmm. And so Washington has the confidence to put 
strong people around him, mm -hmm. and, um, and and I think that's I think that's admirable. Mm -hmm. I think that shows good leadership skills, mm -hmm. and and uh, I, I think we see that. I think the cabinet, the, the Jefferson's invitation to become Secretary of State is so important, because, again, the textbook version of this, and it's in my textbook, which students do plagiarize. <laughs> <laughs> is, you know, they disagreed and the Federalists stand for this and the Democratic Republicans stand for that and it all makes sense and there's a kind of clear choice. Well, that wasn't necessarily how it looked at the time. And I think they agreed on much more than they disagreed about. And Washington genuinely in 1789 and 1790 when Jefferson joins his cabinet, sees him both as a friend and as a talented individual who he can work with. Yeah. And they work together productively for much longer than the stereotype would have you believe. Yeah. And maybe, uh, Frank, we have a, a minute or so to go. Uh, talk, talk about the end of the story and uh, Jefferson getting right posthumously with Washington. You could easily dismiss that as cynicism, but I think you have a different take on that. How do you feel about it? Yeah, so they things end badly for them because Jefferson writes an unflattering letter about Washington in 1796 uh, to an Italian friend of his, Filippo Mazzei. And Mazzei shares the letter. The letter is translated from English into French and then from French back into English, and it's republished in the United States when Jefferson was the vice president. So what he had written as a private citizen was then published when he was the sitting vice president. And it was incredibly embarrassing and it was unflattering to Washington. And Washington, who was very thin skinned and aware of his reputation, was offended. And they never reconciled because Washington died in 1799. I think had they had Washington lived longer, they may have reconciled in the way that Adams and Jefferson reconciled. <clears throat> in Jefferson outlived Washington by 27 years, and in that period, especially during his retirement, he spends a lot of time trying to correct the historical record mm -hmm. to say, you know what, we actually agreed on more than we disagreed about, and Washington really agreed with me, not Alexander Hamilton. Uh, that's not really sustainable. <laughs> but it's easy to be cynical about that and say, no, 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 that wasn't really um, what he meant. It was, you know, that he... he uh, you know, the, the, the cynical view is, oh, this is Jefferson being sneaky mm -hmm. and, and trying to manipulate the record. I think we need to take him at his word because I think two things happened. First of all, he served two terms as president and learned the hard way just how difficult that job is and had a profound respect or grew, his respect for Washington grew because the things that he disagreed with when he was in the cabinet, which ultimately led to his leaving the cabinet, suddenly didn't seem quite as important once he, once he was in the big chair. So I think that was part of it. The other thing is Jefferson had time to reflect on the revolution, the meaning of the revolution, and the meaning of their lives because he had a much longer retirement than Washington mm -hmm. did. And I hope this is a lesson for our contemporary politics. Mm -hmm. With time to reflect, and once passions had cooled, he said, you know, I think we agreed about much more than we disagreed about. If you read Washington's farewell address, and if you read Jefferson's first and second inaugurals, there's not much in those inaugural addresses that Washington would have disagreed with. And I think, again, with time and time to reflect, Jefferson came to appreciate that. Now, he was a partisan in the 1790s, and they were both they both could be act as partisans. Washington always said he wasn't a partisan and was above party. Well, and Jefferson said, no, I didn't write to the press. I didn't, you know, somebody did that for me. Um, you know, uh, but I think once those passions cooled and with some time to reflect, I think, I think, I think sometimes we need to take Jefferson at his word. I think he was genuine when he said, actually, we agreed on a lot. Mm -hmm. Now, he never makes peace with Hamilton. <laughs> and we he got says, shot. well, <laughs> <laughs> True, <laughs> but he didn't do it. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, that's that's what I think. I think we have time for one more comment or question from Annette before we turn to the uh, audience. No, I think we should turn to the audience. All right, okay. Lindsay Cherinsky. Oh, sorry, Lindsay. Can you wait for the microphone, please? Oh, sorry, Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> 